All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, welcome to uh, CNT uh, 260 uh, guide. Uh, it's a wireless to wireless uh, communications. Uh, obviously, we're going to start off with a uh, intro to wireless. Uh, we all know that the wireless communication technologies have had a huge impact around the world today. Uh, most of you are probably actually getting on to this presentation using wireless uh, as we speak. Um, today, wireless communications affects pretty much everything that we do, from using smartphones, uh, making voice calls, to accessing information, the internet, um, keeping up with friends, family, videos, uh, online gaming, you name it. Uh, we pretty much use wireless for everything, even going out and like uh, uh, buying movie tickets uh, and even ordering things uh, online, not e-shopping. Uh, they've completely revolutionized the way that we live. Uh, just as a per PCs uh, eons ago uh, had um, revolutionized how we all worked uh, back in the 1980s, and then the internet changed how we obtained access to information in the 90s. Uh, the internet also changed how we communicate around the world using wireless devices to send and receive messages uh, through a variety of apps, as well as to connect to the internet and access uh, corporate applications and databases. Uh, uh, pretty much everything that we look today, if we look at all the devices, we got compute, laptop computers, tablets, um, uh, digital still pictures, video cameras, printers, uh, Portable music players, uh, your refrigerators, your washers, uh, dryers, watches, uh, even your electric meter and your water meters, your houses, all equipped with some for form of wireless communication today. Um, what we're hoping to get out of this is obvious. We're going to describe the different types of wireless communications. Um, we're going to look at the trends in uh, wireless data communications, and uh, we're going to talk about some of the advantages and challenges of uh, wireless communications uh, today. Now. The wireless communication technologies in itself, and it's important that we understand this, wireless um, communications, okay, um, we have to define what it means to be wireless, okay? It's often used to describe all, all types of electronic devices and technology that's not literally or physically connected by a wire. Um, a garage door opener and uh, television remote can be called wireless devices, although they do transmit data, they have uh, a little in common with the technologies that we're going to be talking about. Uh, because the term wireless is sometimes used to refer to any device that has no wires, people can sometimes be puzzled about the exact meaning of wireless communications. So like a home or office cordless telephone will be considered a wireless device for communicating with the human voice, but that's not what we really talk about when we're talking about a wire, when we're talking about wireless communications. Okay. Uh, for the purpose of this class, wireless communications will be defined as the transmission of digital data while connected to some type of data network uh, without the use of wires. So smartphones, for example, can be used to make a simple voice call, but these devices also have the capabilities to extend much further beyond that and are also able to connect to data networks. Uh, digital data in, in this case may include email, spreadsheets, uh, short messages transmitted uh, to or from your phone. What we're going to be talking about over the next few sections, we're going to look at the various forms that wireless communications can take. Uh, we're going to look uh, about the Wi-Fi based wireless LANs. We're going to talk about Bluetooth, Zigbee, Y gig, radio frequency, radio frequency identification, which is RFID, uh, near field communication, which is NFC, as well as talking about satellite, cellular, fixed broadband. Uh, the specific details of all these technologies we're going to cover in individual sections. Um, but first thing we want to do is take a look at a few examples of technologies. Um, and what it is, what it's like to use a variety of different wireless uh, data devices. So the first thing we want to talk about is your, your standard wireless LAN, possibly the way that you are connecting to the, the this class right now. Um, we begin with Wi-Fi because it's the most common and most recognizable of all the different technologies that we talk about. Imagine that you're you're getting ready to leave home. 
uh, for a busy work day. Uh, while you're getting ready, using the smartphone connection to the Wi-Fi network or perhaps a wireless local area network, um, uh, which enables you to access all the digital data-enabled devices maybe in your house. You can you play some music with your smartphone through wireless speakers. These Wi-Fi-enabled uh, speakers then can play music from any of the devices connected on the Wi-Fi network and be, can be installed uh, anywhere in the house without needs for wires, except, you know, obviously you've got to use a power cord. And then you open up your tablet, you print a spreadsheet um, on your Wi-Fi printer. Uh, you take that to work, you place a call in your office, you pick up your messages using a smartphone uh, and using a, the voice over IP protocol. Um, all that is, is done with wireless networks. Now, because you're inside your home using the Wi-Fi network, your smartphone can automatically connect to, and access to the Internet. Uh, using voice over IP over your wireless network and the Internet instead of a cellular device, you can save money on your bills. Because think about that. Uh, for the longest time, we used to have um, long distance carriers and they used to, you know, lobby and advertise like crazy for our business. And somebody figured out, well, if I can, if I can have a video conference with somebody in Australia when I'm sitting here living in Pennsylvania in the United States, then why can't I just do the same thing with my voice call? And then eventually all your long distance phone companies just kind of faded away. So, <clears throat> um, all that being said, uh, some carriers offer a service that makes the phone call automatically switch the call between your wireless network and your cell network, uh, like Comcast does that. They can forward your calls. Uh, if you're out of range, you're not connected to a Wi-Fi network. It also helps sell the carriers by reducing the amount of uh, voice call traffic on their uh, expensive cellular networks. And it's cheaper to do it over the land network. Yeah. While you're having breakfast, a short beep sound, and you notice that a shopping list has been an emailed to your phone from the refrigerator. Computer system uh, installed in the refrigerator door lets you share a uh, family schedule while making lists as well as exchanging information uh, through your text messages, your email, and other computers. Uh, because the refrigerator is also connected to the internet through your Wi-Fi network, you can access the information even when you're not at home. That's all part of our wireless LAN. Uh, so let's look at some of the technology behind uh, using the home wireless LAN. Okay? Uh, a wireless LAN, really all it is, is an extension of your wired LAN. Wireless devices connect uh, to the network through a wireless access point, or what we call an AP. The AP relays, a, relays uh, data signals between all the devices on the wired network, including your file servers, your printers, etc. The AP is fixed in one place, although it can be moved when necessary. Whereas the devices that connect to the AP are usually portable and have the freedom to move around the office or the house or whatever. In your home, each device is connected to the Wi-Fi or wireless LAN. Um, using a wireless network interface card which communicates with the wireless residential gateway often called the wireless router and then some have you know more than one NIC to allow connection to different types of wireless networks so wireless NIC performs the same function as a wired NIC looks very similar except that it has an antenna rather than a wire coming out of it Uh, the devices can be part of your home or uh, office uh, wireless network. Uh, they can include not only computers, um, that, uh, but they can also be like your VoIP phones. Uh, it can be cordless. Uh, your home entertainment systems like your Xbox, your PlayStation, your Switch, your game consoles, you know. Uh, digital music players, tablet computers, uh, Printers, home security systems, cameras, um, even your, your connection to, uh, to local authorities, um, lighting, uh, environmental controls, your HVAC, your thermostats, a whole bunch of other devices can all be hooked up wirelessly. You can control that way. Wireless LANs operate based on networking standards uh, established by the uh, IEEE, uh, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. 
the IEEE is published uh, and is continuing to work on a series of standards used in wireless LANs. One of the latest standards uh, provides for data transmission speeds of over one gig per second, uh, which means it's over a billion bits per second. Uh, at distances right now of up to about 375 feet or 114 meters. The maximum transmission speeds that can be achieved in wireless lands is totally dependent on the number of radios uh, used simultaneously as well as the it's on the maximum distance of them. And we're going to talk about that a lot more uh, in the upcoming chapters as well. Uh, virtually all smartphones, tablets, and laptop computers today are able to connect to a Wi-Fi network, and most of the latest home security environmental controls, heating and air conditioning, and a few of the newer home appliances, uh, your refrigerators, washers, dryers, etc., even your door locks, uh, your garage doors, uh, all now include the ability to connect to the Internet. It enables you to control um, an ever-growing number of devices in your home from wherever you may be. It's what we call a smart home. Uh, you can also add wireless NICs to desktop computers uh, that may not be equipped with Wi-Fi when you purchase them and then eliminate the need to have a, a network cable. So uh, it, that's, um, it, the, this way you can have them um, in different rooms of the house that maybe might not be cabled. Um, next thing we want to talk about really is our Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth is a wireless technology, part of the standards designed uh, to transmit data at typically uh, very short ranges from a few inches uh, up to typically 10 meters, like 33 feet. Uh, the main purpose of the technology, such as Bluetooth, is to eliminate the uh, cables between devices, such as your smartphones and computers. It allows data to tra be transmitted wirelessly between, say, a computer and a printer, as well as to synchronize your smartphone with your computer. Bluetooth communicates using small, low-power transceivers called uh, radio modules, which are built into tiny circuit boards uh, and contain very small microprocessors. Bluetooth devices use a link manager, which is software that helps to identify other Bluetooth devices. You create a link between them, send and receive the digital data. Could be music, voice, whatever. Um, and then you can also use Bluetooth to share uh, many other types of uh, data as well. Uh, Bluetooth headphones and headsets are probably the most popular. Uh, they avoid uh, annoying wires they can get that get caught in your clothing, door handles, etc. Um, and they can be very easily damaged as well. Uh, Bluetooth is now also common in many other, many other devices, like your smart TVs, uh, which have web browsers that can be connected to the Internet. So, for example, you could connect a Bluetooth keyboard to a smart TV uh, enter a web address from the comfort of your couch, and then Bluetooth is also used for connecting many other types of devices, such as keyboard, mouse, to your computer. It eliminates cables and the need uh, to use USB interfaces uh, for those devices. Um, for example, I, my, uh, my Surface Pens connect to my Microsoft Surface tablet using Bluetooth. Bluetooth is also extensively used to connect smartphones to car audio systems. Uh, provides uh, support for hands-free cellular telephone, as well as for playing, controlling music stored in uh, Bluetooth-equipped smartphones. And I also see them in um, a number of uh, gaming consoles as well. Okay. Among other technologies that use Bluetooth is something called iBeacon. Now, iBeacon was originally developed by Apple, of course. Uh, iBeacon-enabled apps can not only be used in shopping malls and stores to deliver coupons and um, direct regular customers to uh, of a store to maybe some sale items, but it can also be used to help visually impaired persons or uh, more easily to help them more easily find their way around, it's like say a subway station. Uh, iBeacon uses a small, inconspicuous, uh, usually battery-powered Bluetooth transmitters that can be installed on walls and issue voice instructions from an app. Most Bluetooth devices can transfer a mac maximum of uh, between one and three meg uh, at distances of up to uh, 33 feet. But one of the la latest versions of this technology is capable of transmitting data rates of uh, 20 meg per second, or even more. Uh, Bluetooth is also used to connect smartwatches or smartphones and laptops. 
Um, most smartwatches can display notifications saying like who's calling or email messages or text messages that come up. And then you also have like uh, your wearable fitness um, trackers and sleep trackers, which are um, uh, on a lot of our wearable devices as well. Um, <clears throat> The automatic connection between these various uh, devices creates something we call a PicoNet for small small network. Okay, uh, we used to just call them wireless uh, uh, or yeah wireless or personal area networks. Now we call them wireless personal area networks. A PicoNet consists of um, two or more Bluetooth devices. Uh, up to seven devices can belong to a single Bluetooth uh, wireless Pico network. Although Bluetooth can send data through physical barriers like walls, its limited range is more suitable for replacing cables and wires at short ranges rather than long. And uh, to more than uh, 15,000 different computers, smartphone, peripheral, and other equipment vendors today uh, are creating uh, products based on the Bluetooth standard. Next thing we want to talk about it would be something called Zigbee. Okay, now Zigbee is a is a wireless communication standard. It's been over the past uh, few decades, several home automation or smartphone technologies um, have uh, appeared on the market. Most of them were implemented as systems that depend on uh, house electrical wiring. Now, later, wireless capabilities were added in the form of devices that bridge the, uh, between wireless and your home power wires. Uh, particularly, none of these legacy systems are based on standards ratified by the IEEE. Uh, and although they were, there were uh, many compatible devices in the market that support these technologies, um, we're not going to be talking about those because they're really not today's standards. The notable exception that we want to talk about for Zigbee is uh, a wireless communications spec on a uh, IEEE. It's the 802. Dot 15 dot 4 which was intended for short-range transmissions the Zigbee Alliance is the organization that creates and maintains the specifications uh, and it's also certifies compatible products the spec is designed for applications that require devices with long battery life and can transmit data um, <clears throat> at distance between 33 and uh, 50 feet now to pass certification, the battery life of a Zigbee device has to be at least two years, and devices can reach others that are located uh, further than the maximum uh, 50 feet by making use of a mesh network technology. So if my one Zigbee device was, say, 100 feet away with a, uh, from, say, the controller, if there was another Zigbee device in between, it will be able to bridge that gap. Uh, the maximum data rate for Zigbee is up to 250K. Uh, when Zigbee enabled devices um, are not being used, like, uh, like a light switch or something like that, uh, they can save power by turning off their, tran their transmitters for long periods of time and then only wake up uh, to check the status of the network to see if they're being called upon. Um, most smart LED light bulbs uh, produced today by manufacturers like General Electric, Philips, and others are support the Zigbee protocol. And then they can be controlled by something like a central hub, like a Hue hub, if you know, had have those smart devices. In addition to home automation, Zigbee is used for automating entire commercial buildings, um, dramatically reducing the need for control wires for every office to, to be run back to a uh, central control room. Uh, the Zigbee specification covers uh, several other applications in addition to home and building automation. Uh, among these environmental or environmental sensors, um, medical data collection devices, smoke detectors, and security systems, as well as controlling industrial equipment. Next thing I want to cover here is the YGIG specification. YGIG is a, uh, another short-range wireless technology designed for um, use primarily in the home. It can transmit uh, larger quantities of data at much higher speeds. It can send and receive CD and DVD quality, audio and video, as well as Blu-ray, high-def movies from entertainment 
equipment, computers, or mobile devices to a TV. Uh, it can transfer video and sound at up to 7 gig per second. Uh, much slower for your mobile devices that need to conserve battery power. Um, but using this technology called Ultra Wide uh, Band, which is UWB. Uh, however, Y-Gig can transmit up to a distance of only two meters at these high speeds. Thus, its use is confined to like small rooms uh, with few or no obstacles uh, between the transmitter and the, uh, the receiver devices. Which is similar to using a TV remote control. Y-Gig uh, products are just beginning to be introduced. Uh, into the home entertainment market. Uh, wireless routers can support Y-Gig. Um, they also include Wi-Fi and are able to switch automatically between two types of connections uh, when the devices are out of the two meter range of each other. Um, you're gonna learn more about the radio frequencies for Y-Gig uh, as we move on through the, uh, through the class. Next thing I wanna talk about is the radio frequency identification or RFID. It's another short distance wireless technology developed primarily to replace the barcodes uh, that you see on pretty much every product sold today. Uh, barcodes can only store a limited amount of uh, information. The long numbers and sometimes letters are usually printed below the black and white vertical bars of the code. A key advantage of an RFID over a barcode is that the information can be read uh, from the tag regardless of if, whether or not it's uh, visible. Uh, RFID tags are small chips containing a CPU, memory, and other electronic circuitry, plus an antenna. The tags are, offer a way to store and access additional information right on the product or the packaging. Uh, it makes it easier to identify the product type, serial number, where it was manufactured, uh, and when as well as other information. Um, they are an RFID reader and integrator emits electronic waves electromagnetic waves that produce a uh, small amount of current in the, uh, in the tag antenna. The current powers the chip in the tag, which in turn transmits the information stored in the tag's memory. We're gonna talk more about that when we get uh, back in uh, chapter 11. The RFID tags are available in a large variety of types, sizes, self-adhesive labels, key fobs, um, and plastic nails that can be driven into trees. Uh, to help identify and track them during their, their lifetime. Automobiles, can uh, that can be started uh, by simply pressing a button on the dashboard, incorporate an RFID tag uh, in the key fob, and only require the key to be inside the car um, for the engine to start. Some, some RFID tags, called active tags, are battery powered and have a longer range. These tags can include sensors that measure and record environmental parameters uh, that can be used to track, say, like perishable products um, that have been exposed to damaging temperatures or humidity, stuff like that. Uh, some airport airports use RFID to identify luggage. Uh, it's a system that vastly reduces the possibility of bags being lost or redirected. As shipments are loaded and unloaded from a truck and carried into a warehouse, boxes are, are that include RFID tag can be read right at the loading dock update the inventory, and then also would it be directing the forklift on where to put the uh, put the inventory. One of the most common uses of RFID today uh, is for inventory control. So instead of employees counting inventory manually, an extremely time consuming and often inaccurate task, RFID readers can be installed throughout the building and inventory can be counted automatically by a computer operator located in an office as pretty much as often as they choose to do it. Uh, tags can be read at varying distances anywhere from you know, an inch up to usually you know, 100 meters, 330 feet. Uh, data rates uh, are usually only a few k, k per second, but it's more than enough for a small amount of data contained in a, in a typical tag, which is just, you know, what it is, where it was from, everything else. Right. Next thing we want to talk about is something called NFC, which is near field communication, it's similar to uh, RFID. And in fact, some RFID equipment is also able to read NFC tags. 
Uh, it's intended to work at an average of about two to four inches uh, between a sing uh, single tag and a device or in between two cable devices. The transmission speed is about 250k per second, so it's suitable for reading items like credit or debit, debit cards or some other types of wireless communication between um, the two devices. Uh, the protocol allow, uh, allow battery powered devices to exchange information and if authorized, both read and write data to each other using secure encrypted communication. Now, while most RFID tags are passive and designed to store fixed numbers in a predetermined format, NFC tags can include more flexible information like web addresses, commands, or instructions. Now this technology has been incorporated into many smartphones and into tablets today. So when two NFC equipped devices are brought close to each other, they can then read data uh, containing instructions like those, uh, uh, like how to automatically configure a Bluetooth connection or between them to set up a peer-to-peer Wi-Fi network to transfer larger amounts of data. Now, smartphones and tablets equipped with NFC are sometimes able to write on the tags. Um, for example, if you could configure an NFC tag to open your email app on your tablet so that you would have not have to search for the tag icon on the screen and then tap it to access your email account, blah, blah, blah. Uh, payment systems like Google Wallet and Apple Pay uh, use NFC to read information uh, from an app on your phone that allows you to pay for purchases with uh, how needing to access uh, your wallet or use a credit card or a debit card system. Tap to pay, debit, credit, uh, also use NFC uh, to enable you to pay for purchases, usually on, of a small value, uh, often without needing to insert a card or swipe a magnetic strip and then enter your PIN on a, key, on a keypad, which you know just help you speed up your transaction uh, all the more. Next, we want to talk about a wireless metropolitan area or a wide area network, really just what it is at this point. Um, the uh, technologies in this section are, are used for communications over a wide area. Um, these wireless technologies offer areas ranging from an entire city all the way up to, you know, the largest wide area network that we know of in the world, the Internet. Um, <clears throat> we begin with a look at satellite networks. Uh, and then we'll talk about the cellular and some microwave links as well. Now, the satellite networks, um, companies have, off, have offices and stores in locations where a wired connection to the Internet is not easily available and can use satellite communications to connect to the Internet. Uh, isolated communities uh, away from uh, the major cities in many countries frequently make use of satellite communications for Internet access. International airlines offer Wi-Fi connections in flight and use satellite connections to enable the tra travelers to access the internet. Uh, passengers can then use this connection to connect to corporate networks, especially during long overseas flights. Courier companies making deliveries in remote locations can use can use uh, satellite networks. Uh, to enable travelers to, to access the internet. Passengers can get the connection to their corporate networks. Um, where was I? Um, courier companies making deliveries to remote locations can use satellite-based internet and phone connections to track and update deliveries uh, and pickups, as well as uh, update truck routes and track the location and status of their delivery vehicles in real time. Uh, news organizations use satellite phones to establish a private connection to their data networks. Um, as you can see here, it's similar to what we were looking at. And then, you know, you've got your transponders up on on the earth and the two points on the earth and then communicating to the satellite up above. Now, in the satellite communications, a device called a repeater um, <clears throat> is, lo is literally located in the satellite itself. And then the earth station transmits to the satellite um, on a on one frequency band, and then the satellite would then regenerate and retransmit the signal back to Earth on a different frequency. The transmission time needed to repeat the signal from the Earth station to another can be up to 
250 milliseconds, uh, depending on the type of satellite used and its uh, distance from the surface to the planet. Now, satellite communications are often handled through third party or dedicated providers instead of the usual land based communications companies. Um, the first satellite uh, to orbit Earth successfully was actually called Sputnik. Now, it was launched by the Soviet Union back in 1957. Uh, today, there's more than 900 operational satellites uh, that orbit the, uh, the Earth and uh, reportedly over 5,000 that are no longer even functional. It's only due to some truly amazing mathematical calculations, pretty much that they, uh, that they don't crash into one another. But on February 10th, 2009, a non-operational Russian satellite did crash into an, an uh, Iridium-33 30, uh, uh, communication satellite, uh, which is used for uh, satellite phones. Uh, global positioning or GPS used for determining the location of your, say, your phone, your GPS receivers, you know, if you've got your location services turned on. Um, <clears throat> also based on satellite technology, dedicated satellites containing an atomic clock send uh, timing signals to both GPS devices and Earth-based receivers, uh, which use the timing information from multiple sat satellites uh, to triangulate their position uh, on the surface with reference to the position of the satellites uh, in orbit. Uh, GPS receivers can also provide traffic information uh, to moving vehicles. The traffic information is transmitted from Earth stations, uh, not the satellites, usually via the same type of signal um, that would be used, say, for like FM radio stations. Uh, GPS is not uh, strictly a data communication technology in the sense that GPS receivers are similar to in-car audio and do not communicate back to satellites. Uh, some aftermarket GPS receivers are also equipped with Bluetooth and use this to transmit turn-by-turn -turn directions through the vehicle's audio systems instead of tiny speakers in the GPS uh, device itself. Uh, satellite radio, such as like Sirius XM, um, in North America uh, or Astra in Europe is another example of a technology that is not strictly data communication. Satellite receivers uh, do not communicate back to the satellites. Detailed coverage of GPS and satellite radio is much more than what we're going to be talking about in this class. So we're not going to go into into uh, deep conversations about that. Um, we need to talk about the modern cellular telephone network, so. The, tech, the cellular digital technology is widely used today to maintain connections while uh, you're at a range of your Wi-Fi network. The cellular communications today spans not only cities, but can cover an entire country as well as a continent, um, enabling users to travel uh, longer distances and being able to make voice calls uh, and then also access the Internet. A modern cellular telephone company is built around the concept of low power transmitters, which can uh, I'm sorry. With each with each cell, so the low power transmitters with each cell handles a number of users. Now, how many users can connect to a cell depends on the type of cellular technology. So with Transmission towers spread throughout a city as well as along major highways. The same radio frequencies channel can be used by towers uh, located only a few miles from each other, thereby avoiding interference. The issue is that there is only a limited range of radio frequencies available, and the concept of cells maximizes the use of available frequency channels by reusing the same frequency uh, two or more in uh, antenna towers away from each other. This is also made possible within major urban centers by using uh, low power digital uh, transmission technology. It permits another transmitter to use the same frequency um, the same way or the same frequency a relatively short distance away without causing interference problems. We'll talk about that later on in the class as well. 
And tablet computers um, also equipped with uh, cellular technology. So like if you have a tablet, like say you have an iPad or you got a Galaxy or whatever, and it has a SIM card slot, they can use cellular technology. Um, and it, it allows them to be able to access digital data when they're away from the Wi-Fi network. Most smartphones today allow wireless tethering, meaning that you can use them to create a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, those are different uh, typically um, than, say, your data. So, for example, if you have unlimited data, you might not have unlimited Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, so, for example, on my personal plan, I have unlimited data, but I have a 10 gig Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, a Wi-Fi hotspot um, allows me to wirelessly connect my laptop or my phone or a tablet um, to my to my data, so that I can have uh, uh, so I can have access remotely. Uh, courier companies are one of the first types of businesses to use dedicated terminals to read a barcode information on package labels. Uh, allows the customer to electronically sign on the LCD screen and transmit the information immediately to the main office via cellular network. So for example, FedEx shows up at your door, drops off a package, they might want you to sign for it right there. You sign in a digital pad and then it automatically goes right out to the internet and says, package has been delivered. Uh, I've actually gotten uh, photos um, from the courier that uh, show my, um, my package in the, I have a little box out in front of my house for packages to be delivered and they'll show the package in the box to show me that it's been delivered. Um, lately now we're at 4G technology. We've had 2G, 3G, these are just stands for generation. Uh, 4G um, or fourth, uh, fourth generation, sends data to mobile device that rates that can theoretically reach well over 100 meg per second. And we're up to gig now with our LTE. Um, and the upstreaming data of usually like a half a gig at about 500 meg. 4G technologies today are being deployed worldwide. They're expected to eventually harmonize all the different digital uh, cellular specifications around the world into a single standard. We know now we're already up to 5G. In most cases, when you're outside of the reach of a 4G or 5G network, a mobile device will then switch to a third G technology, which is considerably slower. Um, and the data is actually packaged differently for those. That's an example of the handheld terminal that we just mentioned earlier. Now, using cellular technologies, companies can create a wide area, uh, a wireless wide area network that enables their employees to access corporate data and applications from virtually anywhere in the country, um, the entire continent, uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, we have fixed broadband wireless in areas where wired internet connectivity may not be available and where the installations of cables may be difficult. Uh, solution is, often is to deploy wireless links uh, based on microwave data equipment or what we call WiMAX. Uh, I believe that was 802.15 uh, or 16. These technologies are commonly called fixed broadband wireless because they originally were intended for communications between fixed points uh, like buildings or towers through the WiMAX specification. Uh, which is 82.16. Uh, um, which was a standard that was uh, to include an amendment for mobile communications as well. Now, even in cities, traditional high-speed land-based digital phones, uh, phone lines, uh, such as like your T1s or faster, um, or maybe today we'll, we'll have our fiber optics for more modern cables, uh, they're expensive and because we pretty much have to rent them and the cost is far too much to install and maintain. So these types of wire connections are usually installed uh, by and then leased from a telephone um, and other utility companies who already own most of the communication infrastructure. Uh, technologies like such as cable modems, which uh, um, 
one, you use a television cable connection to provide internet access are generally available only in or near residential areas. Um, so, we, you, you know, there's where you might want to use a fixed broadband wireless if you can't afford the cable or if it's not in your area. Today, we also have digital subscriber lines, which use either regular or special telephones, telephone lines, uh, and, and sometimes, um, some cases that's available, but the speed is dependent on the distance between the company and the um, <clears throat> and the uh, and the switch ports or central office. The best and lowest cost for companies to link their office locations today will be using a, a wireless metropolitan area network. Um, a single wireless metropolitan area, area network link can cover an area of about 25 square miles. Uh, which is about 40 square kilometers, and it can be used to carry data, voice, and video signals. Uh, some uh, WMANs today are based on the 802.16 WiMAX fixed broadband wireless standard. They use radio waves for data communications. Longer distance uh, links of 35 miles are usually installed by carriers. And similar um, types of service providers uh, using microwave data transceivers can uh, can then transmit up to a 400 meg per second. Some companies, such as those in the petroleum drilling companies um, and extraction industry, install their own dedicated networks in remote areas to ensure that data they collect is made available at their central office as quickly as possible. Uh, WiMAX can transmit at speeds of up to 75 meg per second. Uh, at distances up to four miles. And 17 to 50 meg per second, uh, depending on the link quality, as distance up to six miles um, in a straight line. Now, a recent amendment to WiMAX, which is the 82 out of 16 uh, M, can achieve uh, speeds of up to 100 meg per second and up to a gig if it's a point to point link. Now, the use of antennas uh, substantially reduces the cost of WiMAX uh, when compared to having to run a wire from the cable company, from the phone company. Those are the T1s that we mentioned, the fiber that, you know, they all are coming from, say, AT&T, Verizon, or whoever your, your infrastructure carrier is. Um, WiMAX, when compared to traditional wire connections, uh, is going to be cheaper. So it requires the installation um Wire connections uh, would be installed typically like above the road, under the road. Um, they're more prone to damage uh, and they're expensive to uh, repair and to maintain. So the whole wireless landscape uh, itself, okay, uh, most of what we do in terms of data access uh, in a typical day um, could not be attempted, much less completed without the wireless technology. Um, as new wireless communication technology is introduced, they're going to continue to be part of our lifestyle. They will continue to change how we live. Um, this example here shows a visual comparison of the range of different wireless data technologies that we've spoken about. Uh, the speed of wireless networks uh, will vary greatly depending on the number of users that are connected. Uh, the amount of data traffic, the amount of interference present at that time, and a whole bunch of other factors that we're going to talk about um, th throughout this, this class. Um, now, just as the number of wireless devices will dramatically increase, so will the number of job opportunities to support these uh, new technologies. Uh, the demand for professionals such as wireless engineers, wireless network managers, wireless technical support personnel, and people who build and maintain the networks, it's going to continually grow and grow uh, for years to come. This, you know, this this presentation that I'm doing today could be considered to be out of date in six months, you know. I hope not. Uh, so where is it all going from here? Uh, users are constantly demanding more functionality from their computers. Uh, and as a result, wireless devices like your cell phone and your tablets, they're being combined into single devices, um, what we today call smartphones or phablets. Uh, these devices have also continued to add capabilities, uh, whereas they were initially used as appointments and, 
calendars, uh, contact lists, and phones today. Uh, they, they, your people are playing computer games and they're doing sophisticated graphics and they're playing movies and music as well as giving us web access and running our businesses and our utility software and everything else. Now, some carriers even provide users with the ability to watch live TV um, and the full-length movies right on their right on their smartphones. Uh, the term digital convergence refers to the power of digital devices such as desk and laptop computers and your smartphones and your handhelds to combine voice and video and uh, text processing capabilities. Uh, that's the convergence of everything that we do into one single device. The, the recent and upcoming advances in wireless technology and standards discussed uh, in this class are going to enable and and ever wider range of applications for wireless devices. Uh, there are now smartphones that incorporate all voice and data communications in addition to providing entertainment functions and allowing user to make payments uh, and debits directly from a bank or a prepaid account. Uh, digital wireless communications have expanded almost beyond human imagination. And this trend is likely to continue um, at, at an incredibly fast pace. Uh, the networks have over have uh, overcome most of the speed limitations since the original wireless LAN was introduced uh, and approved. Uh, at one time, paperless tablet devices like the ones that you've seen in the old Star Trek movies were practically unthinkable. And today, they are commonplace in homes and offices and are being used at a, at a very wide range of applications. Patients can swallow a tire. Um, a tiny wireless camera installed in a capsule that enables a doctor to conduct examinations inside a person's body without need for an exploratory surgery. Um, there are a lot of advantages um, to using wireless technology compared to a wired network. And they, they include mobility, obviously. Um, there, it's easier and lower cost installation, increased reliability and more uh, rapid disaster recovery. Mobility um, is the freedom to move without being tethered by the wires. Um, it's a, one of the biggest advantages that we have with wireless networks themselves. Um, mobility enables users to stay connected to the network no matter where they where they roam within the network's range. Uh, many workers who can't stay tied to a desk, say like a police officer or for a lot of our first responders who need access to, say, like a vehicle registration and infraction records or inventory clerks who work in a large store or warehouse. They're finding that wireless data communications have become a vital uh, performance of their jobs. I'll give you an example. We were we were at Lowe's a couple of weeks ago and we were asking if they had any more of, um, of a particular product and uh, the, uh, the attendant just pulls out their thing, looks like a smartphone, taps a few things, says, oh, we'll have more here on Thursday. But you can also get them at this store, this store, and this store. So it's pretty cool, you know, the inventory and the uh, the, the uh, convenience of having all that technology at your fingertips. Uh, it in wireless technology uh, enables many industries to shift toward an increasingly uh, mobile workforce. Many employees spend large portions of their time away from their desk. Um, so whether they're meetings or working on a hospital floor or conducting research, research laptop computers, uh, and more recently your tablet computers, smartphones, and other portable devices, they're allowing employees to um, enjoy the convenience of uh, having access to their companies and applications from pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, installing these network cabling uh, selling network cabling is a difficult, slow, and it can, it can be a costly task, um, especially in older buildings. Uh, facilities constructed prior to the 80s were probably built without any thought given to the rising computer revolution. So uh, we had thick masonry walls and poured concrete walls and plaster and everything that's difficult for um, to us to drill holes and put cabling in. And now we have the ability in these instances to put in wireless LAN solutions. Um, uh, 
things like historical buildings that we you know in some cases you're not even allowed to cut into these walls uh, we have the capabilities of putting in wireless lamps and giving giving our customers the ability to wirelessly connect uh, wireless lamps make it easier for any office to be modified uh, with new cubicles or furniture no longer does the design for a remodeled office have to consider the location of a computer jack in the wall Instead, the focus can be on creating a more effective work environment. Uh, the amount of time required to install network cabling is generally significant. Although the cable itself is not expensive, installers have to pull the wires through the ceiling, drop the cables into the walls, um, into the network outlet, which can usually take uh, days or even weeks to complete. And, um, in countries where labor costs are high, this can make it very expensive. And uh, except in the case of a brand new building, uh, employees must somehow continue their work in the midst of a construction zone, which is often difficult to do. So using a wireless LAN then would eliminate uh, any type of disruption for that. Um, network cables can fail. Um, network cable failures uh, may be the most common source of network problems. Moisture in the air, uh, a leak during a stormy, during a stormy season, or Something as simple as a spilled cup of coffee can cause a network cable to be um, to be faulty. Um, users shifts computer and desk might break a network connection. When cables are installed in the ceiling or behind walls, a cable splice that is done incorrectly can result in unexplainable errors. Now, please understand that for those of you who have taken the cabling classes, you would know that we don't do splices in walls. Every cable, according to the IEEE standards, must be a home run from the network communication, telecommunications board all the way back to the switching closet. But it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Okay? Accidents happen. Um, fires, tornadoes, floods, whatever. Uh, any organization that's not prepared to recover from such a disaster will find itself quickly out of business. A documented disaster recovery plan is vital to every business, and it's how we get back to work. Now, because the computer network is such a vital part of a daily operation of a business, the ability to have the network up and working after disaster is critical. Uh, many businesses are turning to wireless LANs as a major piece of their disaster recovery plan. In addition to using the 802.11n or 802.11ac wireless networking as their main connectivity solution, Savvy planners keep laptop computers with wireless NICs and access points to reserve in reserve along with backup network servers. Then in the event that an unfortunate disaster like a flood or a fire, hurricane or tornado or whatever, um, they can turn to uh, those reserve devices as well to bring their networks back up. Now, along with many advantages of wireless technology, there are going to be some challenges and some concerns. Uh, including uh, radio signal interference, security issues, and health risks. Uh, because wireless devices operate using radio signals, the potential for two signals to interfere with each other does exist. Virtually uh, any wireless device can be a source of interference to other devices. Uh, several common office devices emit signals uh, with re that uh, can cause problems um, with your wireless lands, and those are listed uh, for you. Your mic, believe it or not, I mean, all these devices right here that are on your screen are all operating 2.4 gigahertz, and this so does your 802.11. Um, B, G, and N all operate on that, and so do Zigbee devices. Uh, they are all operating on Bluetooth, all operating on the same radio frequency. Maybe different channels, but the same radio frequencies. Interference is nothing new for computer data networks, okay? So understand that. Now, even when using cables to connect network devices, interfering from, let's say, a fluorescent light or light fixture, an electrical motor can sometimes disrupt in the transmission data. The solution for wireless devices is the same as that for standard cable, locate the source of interference, and eliminate it. Okay? Security has always been a concern uh, for network administrators, and it has not gotten any easier with wireless. Because a wireless device emits a signal that can cover a wide area, security becomes a major concern. It is possible for an intruder to be lurking outdoors at a laptop computer and a wireless network card, 
with the intent of intercepting a signal from the nearby wireless network. Um, some wireless technologies can provide added levels of security. A special coded number can be programmed into an, an authorized wireless device that must uh, then transmit this special number prior to gaining access to the network. Uh, there are um, things as rogue APs can be connected to a wire network uh, by a disgruntled employee, someone trying to intercept the um, networks as well, you know, your transmissions. Right? And there are health risks. High levels of radio frequency can produce biological damage through uh, through heating if, heating effects. Um, typically, these wireless devices emit, emit low levels of uh, radio frequency energy while being used. Scientists know that high levels of RF can produce uh, uh, high level or biological damage. Uh, this is how a microwave oven is able to cook food. However, it is not known if low levels of RF can cause adverse health effects, although some research has been done to address these questions. And, but there is no clear picture on the biological effects of this type of uh, radio frequency radiation. In the United States, the Food and Drug Administration and the FCC set policies and procedures for some wireless devices such as cellular phones. However, only the WHO, the World Health Organization, currently conducts and sponsors research on this topic. In May of 2011, the World Health Organization issued a warning that wireless devices can be carcinogenic, but also included a statement that there is no clear adverse health effects that can be directly linked to cancer or other biological problems in human beings. In the announcement was more specifically directed at users of cellular handsets, which place a transmitter antenna very close to the head uh, during a call. One of the ways to alleviate the danger is to always use a headset when talking on a cellular device. And that concludes our um, uh, our uh, lesson for today. I do want to add one more thing about the uh, health factor here. Uh, the SEC and the FDA, along with the EPA, uh, establish an, an, an RF exposure safety guideline for wireless phones back in 1996. Now, before a wireless phone is available for sale to the public, it has to be tested by the manufacturer and certified that it does not exceed specific limits. One of the limits expressed um, as a specific absorption rate. Um, the specific absorption rate relates to the measurement of the rate of absorption of RF energy by a wireless phone user. The SEC required that the SAR uh, of handheld wireless phones not exceed 1.6 watts per kilogram averaged for one gram of tissue. Now, science today does not yet permit us to draw a definitive conclusion about the safety of wireless mobile phones or mobile devices, although there is no proof that using mobile wireless devices has, has any adverse health effects. So you, right now, there's no proof, um, and this is what I wanted to point out, that you know, you're going to get sick if you use your wireless phone. Uh, I don't want people freaking out about that, not that I think anyone's willing to give up their wireless phones. But I want to put that out there. So that concludes our lesson for today. Um, and we will pick up with the, uh, the next chapter um, next time we meet.